Today, I have the privilege of speaking with Mr. Sean Alexander Allen, the president and CEO and game director of New Challenger, a game development studio out of New York City. Is that correct? Yeah. Excellent. How are you today, Sean? A little tired, but good otherwise. <laughs> what about I you? I hear you're up late watching a classic movie. <laughs> yeah. And, and working. Just kind of one thing over here, one thing over there. Yeah, when you're running your own game studio, I imagine that the hours just never end. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I could have gone to sleep a little earlier, but yeah, I was just in, in the zone. It was a lot of writing or whatever. Yeah, I got to take advantage of the inspiration when the mood strikes. So you are currently working on a game called Treachery in Beatdown City, which I believe is a combination of side-scrolling brawler like Double Dragon or Final Fight with some tactical elements. Can you tell us a little bit more about it? Yeah, um, so, I mean, one of my favorite games when I was a kid, I mean, I like a lot of brawlers, but one of my favorite games was Double Dragon. And but I always like the aspect of these games as being like kind of single player. Like Double Dragon on NES was this single player game that has leveling up mechanics. And I also really like uh like wrestling games like Fire Pro Wrestling and uh, that that one's like hyper technical. So and I love fighting games, but I was never really good at them as a kid. I'm better now, but you know. You can't always find time to fight like, you know, your friends or whatever. And, you know, everyone loves like Street Fighter Alpha 3 when it had that single player mode where it was like innovative fights against different types of characters and whatever. And so what we're doing here is we're making a game where it's got the side scrolling brawler and aspect where you're in this space that you can move up and down in the pseudo 3D space, uh, breaking open objects to get food out of them. But uh, the enemies aren't really... Uh, like three six hit kill enemies they're more like kind of like fighting game enemies where you could fight one to three of them at a time and uh, they have their own tactics and so in that sense also like I wanted to give characters a lot of moves so uh, but you know the problem is, is that when you add a lot of stuff to a game like how many people are going to remember that what if you press like a plus b plus four plus something else like what does all that do um like and so in order to remove that barrier of execution from there i wanted to put in a like a turn-based element where you can bring up a menu kind of like it reminds me of a and uh fallout 3 and how fallout 3 is kind of a bad shooter but when you play it as like this RPG with the VAT system, when you bring up the gun and you line it up on people and you just blow them away, you feel like really powerful in the game and it doesn't make it feel like you didn't do any of that. It actually makes you feel more empowered because you're like, wow, I like targeted that guy's face and his head exploded. Uh, so, and it gave this weight to every shot that you did. So I wanted to make you be able to build these build combos or do all these different things using this little menu. So instead of having to remember like all the directions, you're more trying to, you can pick whatever you want, but you'll see that some moves are more uh, effective at certain times, like, like grapples certain versus certain enemies might be very effective right off the bat, or they might not be effective until later on in the fight. And that's kind of all up to you. That's what you want to learn. Like, it's not about remembering execution. It's more about remembering, like, opportunity or just, you know, because, like, one of my favorite things in Fire Pro is if you walk up to an enemy and try to suplex them uh, right off the bat, there's, like, a 90% chance that they'll reverse it automatically. And there's no, like, because it just doesn't make any sense for, like, because that game's all about building it's not about like just being explosive from the top because that's, you know, pro wrestling's about building. Like you do, it's kind of like a play. Like you don't do the third act right off the bat. But if you, you could perhaps, you could perhaps do your strongest move right off the bat. So it's kind of like this, uh, no execution, but just say like, eh, hey, you could kind of do whatever you want and see how it goes from there. And then a lot of the characters are, like city based and like, but you're fighting like biker gangs and thugs and remnants of gentrification and stuff like that. So, so it's a game that has this interesting combat, but also set in like a city besieged by like debt and like there's lots of store for rent signs all over the place. And, uh, but then there's people who just want to party and then they want, they don't want to move out of your way. So then you've got to fight them. 
And the plot sounds similar to Bad Dudes, if I interpreted the trailer correctly, where the president has been kidnapped by ninja dragons. Is that right? Ninja dragon terrorists. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, um, yeah, I mean, like, I like, I've actually been thinking about that because I actually wanted to make a game. Uh, I really love Bad Dudes. And I was like, I want to make a sequel to Bad Dudes. And I was like, I want to make a game that's, like, similar to NARC. And then I was like, I want to make a sequel to both of them. And then I was like, maybe I can make, like, a parody bad dudes narcs game and then i kept thinking about them and you know it's like bad dudes is weird because ronald reagan is a character that nobody would want to save really besides like dudes like rich dudes in suits so and and also the premise of two dudes from the city going to rescue the president is kind of stupid um which i love like i like that game but so so I kind of had to think about like, what does rescuing the president mean? Like what would create that situation? And then also, you know, Ninja Dragons, it's like they were like, like ninjas were the pop culture reference of the eighties. Right. And, but now we're in this time where like the question of what is a terrorist, like his being thrown around, like there was the whole thing with the, the bombing in Boston, where they were confused that it was a white Muslim terrorist because they all thought they all pulled in all the brown Arab terror, all the brown Arabs, Muslims that were in the area that were running from the explosion and said, and they were like, well, how did you think those guys were terrorists? And they said, because they were running from the explosion. And then it's like, well, would you run towards the explosion? Like, so, I mean, that just kind of shows. And we've, you know, we're in this time where gunmen versus terrorists are things that people throw out. So I feel like we're kind of at this point, you know, like Osama bin Laden became pop culture terrorist number one, right? Like a guy who could have been dead for years, our country tells us, oh yeah, he's dead now. And you're like, oh, okay. Um, so, but you know, he's like this villain, right? That people kind of built to be bigger than could possibly be. So I feel like we're at this point where it's like, well, what is a terrorist? So like, well, what if they were ninja dragon terrorists? Would people question something as kind of stupid, stupidly named as that? Like, right? Like, so it's kind of, and I don't know. And uh, I don't know, I've, I've, by thinking about it also, like going back, like you notice that there's been lots of ninja terrorist organizations, like Cobra is a ninja terrorist. Like I like watching the new GI Joe movie and it's like, they are, ninjas that are terrorists right that are like swinging from things but also like blowing up buildings so it's apparently something that people have done a lot before but i just was like i wanted to i wanted to add this little thing because it's about like and also essentially if the if ninjas kidnap the president wouldn't they essentially be terrorists like right off the bat like so but i wanted to give them that give that's the thing the heart like Harkening back to like Ninja Dragon, because yeah, like uh, Bad Dudes versus Dragon Ninja. So that was kind of like the one thing that I took from Bad Dudes and kept like the president getting kidnapped, but it's President, you know, Barack Obama. And because uh, I felt like he mattered more, like he's a person that, you know, whether you like him, dislike him, whatever, he's a symbol, right? People bought t shirts with him on, with like Obama's face on them. So it's like, like, Obama showed a different way to a lot of people, even if people are upset now. I don't know necessarily how I feel, but uh, I felt like it was like, yeah, okay, these this group of minorities from the city, they would totally be about like saving the president because you know it's like it seems different. He doesn't seem like a like a traditionally white dude in a suit who's being hyper oppressive in the seventies. So is one of your goals of this game to provide some sort of a social commentary? Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, it's kind of built up. That's, that's, uh, I mean, cause like another part of the story is that, uh, the, the billionaire president of East Fulton, Mike Moneybags, like won't let the police, uh, investigate. And, and then he asks for like billions of dollars in, federal funding for that and it's just kind of like well and uh you end up having to fight like money bag security so they're like his uh 
private security force. And so, A, it's like, you know, it's a critique on like, you know, what's it like to have a billionaire for a mayor of a major metropolitan city uh, that, and then also like kind of like what extent will the rich do to obfuscate like, like justice of any kind? Will they ask for more money for like the city? You know, it's like, cause like the funny thing about like our former billionaire mayor who was the mayor that I had no chance to vote against really, because I was, I turned 18 voting for a mayor that pretty much stone like steamrolled every election with like hundreds of thousands of dollars of like funding out of his own pocket, taking a $1 salary every year, just to pretty much say that I don't need the money. Um, but I prefer the power, right? Like it's interesting. And he even illegally ran for a third election in our game, the president uh, in our game, the mayor has run for, an even more illegal fourth election and won and pretty much bought it and that the city is not happy with that. Um, and so you run into his private security for forces and they're kind of a little bit more extreme. They are built up of people who are a little bit like kind of like these archetypes of extremist police forces that you've seen in the past, even the recent past, like, like one of the police guys used mustard spray and kind of looks a little bit like that classic dude spraying off to the side. Um, and so I feel like, and a lot of the character classes have to deal with a lot like this, this entitlement. There's a lot of discussion, like, you know, there's a little cutscene block blocks, like a uh, Ninja Gaiden style or whatever, where um, like there's a scene where uh, you, the character Bruce, uh, it's a black Jamaican dude, and he rolls up on three white guy, uh, th three white people who are just hanging out, and uh, he's just like, "Excuse me, I need to get by." They're like, and they're like, "Hey, man, we already gave you money," and he's like, "What? Like, I have all the money that whatever," and they're like, "Hey, look, now he's rapping. Now we don't want your CD either, pal." And he's like, "What are you?" And they're like, and then he's like, "Well, now we're gonna fight because like," and it's just like you know, there's. Cause I mean, there's, there's this weird, like, uh, I don't know. There's, I want to handle like entitlement, gentrification, racism, mistaken identity, like all these things kind of in these little, these little vignettes that end up, you know, kind of maybe driving the, the reason why you're fighting a little more because the main people don't really want to fight. Like, it's not like that's their thing. And because that's always kind of weird. You play a lot of these games where people are just like never questioning why they're doing what they're doing. And in this, it's because you're not really killing anybody. So it's, it's OK. <laughs> you know, it's OK to to fight someone for a bit for like a like, I don't know, something that's a little more than just uh, just because. Now, what about the makeup of the heroes? I believe that unlike bad dudes, you don't have two white dudes fighting the bad guys. Yeah, uh, bad, bad dudes was funny because I was always like a kid and I was just like, yeah, you know, these two white dudes in black tank tops and white baggy jeans with high tops going around fighting ninjas. Like, yeah, that's me. And it's like, it's not. Um, <laughs> and it was funny because, I mean, I played the game with like two other like kids like with like black parents and it was just funny because we were i mean we were all of like this ambiguous mix dish whatever but like um so it was always funny that it was like three of us sitting around playing as these two white guys or in double dragon too, same two white guys fighting against like this never-ending uh like straight like conveyor belt of like other people like ninjas or like darker skinned people or whatever so yeah i mean uh bruce's uh jamaican black dude i um and uh who kind of was born in the hood like born really poor and but is like, a really smart dude and got really rich and like is in like a kind of like a wall street dude um and he even, like, when you first meet him in the game, when you find him, he's uh, to pick him up to go on the, you know, it's in the tutorial level or whatever. He complains. He's more upset that 
uh, the president's kidnapping tanked the stock market, then because that's his thing, right? It's like he wants to, he's, he's not the, like, I wanted to make sure everybody wasn't like altruistically good. It's always weird when they're like, oh, every hero is like just out for the better good of man. And it's like, you know, Bruce has a job to do, right? He has to make money. Like if the president gets kidnapped, it's like, well, he's not going to be the one to save him unless someone asks him to. So it's like, you know, he's got to think about his bottom line. And uh, then there's Lisa, who uh, we start the game off as uh, Lisa Santiago. She's a Puerto Rican lady who grew up in East Fulton, kind of middle class. Her dad is the, the police commissioner. And uh, so she does like MMA and boxing. We wanted to make like a, want to make like a standard, like cool woman to play as because now my wife designed her, my wife, Diana Santiago, which is no relation. Um, and uh, she, so yeah, she's kind of like this really cool character who is like a, wants to be a police officer, but hasn't graduated the police academy yet. And then there's uh, Brad, uh, Brad the Bull Killer Steel, who's uh, of um, like Mexican descent from like around the Texas Mexico border, and he used to wrestle and his career was kind of ended over a beef about the legality of his family's presence in the country in the U S cause he was being blackmailed. So he pretty much like walked away rather than, uh, rather than like have his family get deported or it all become like really public and have to fight all that stuff. And so he just kind of settled down in East Fulton to be like a community, uh, like to run a community center. Now, do you feel that adding social commentary to a game detracts from its escapism? No, not really. I mean, I it's I think every every game is social commentary in a lot of ways. Like, I mean, or it's common. Every game has a statement, right? Like, I mean, even if it's I don't know. It's funny. Like space invaders feels very xenophobic because it's about space invaders. Like it's about fearing the unknown. So, I mean, I don't really know if, like, I think the little bits and pieces that are here, um, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's written. There's no, there's no character voicing anything. You could pay attention to it or not. I mean, I feel like, you know, I don't know, like some of the greatest pieces of work, like uh, the Divine Comedy, uh, Dante's Inferno, like is is one part like thriller of walking through hell, and the other part is that he cast all these political people as like it, they are in hell because of the terrible things that he did. I mean, and that's like that's like a book that's one of the most innovative things that invented, like helped invent the in like Italian language and did all this other stuff and it's gone down in history as being amazing. I don't, um, if that book can do that, you know, like it's a book about hell (laughs) and like all this other stuff. I think, uh, a video game should be able to do that. Now, do you feel that the social commentary aspect or the makeup of your characters will affect its commercial viability? For example, some publishers claim that a video game that stars a female protagonist or which has a woman on the cover art of the box will sell less well than a game featuring a guy. Are you, do you have any of those concerns for your game? No. Um, I mean, I did. It's interesting, like, because uh, the initial design for my cover art that I was, like, just mocking up when, because uh, uh, my wife, Diana, she, she made the act, like, the, the key art that we used in our campaign. Uh, and it, it's like a watercolor piece that's like two feet tall or something like that. Um, but so I initially just had this idea like of like Lisa in the middle punching and then the other two off to the sides. And then I had this like this kind of like fear thing where I was just like, wait, you can't put a woman in the middle. Like then everyone's going to think the game's about a woman. And it's like, and then I was just like later on, I was just like, yeah, who gives a crap? Like, I don't know. I mean, that's actually, it's actually kind of funny because I feel like I, I bonded with, uh, this is how me and, uh, 
Nyan uh, from Playism started talking uh, on Twitter was I was like, it's like Capcom, like a lot of those people were good friends of mine. Like I know like Yoshinori Ono like pretty well. And, uh, and it was funny because when they said that like deep down is a game that, you know, it doesn't make sense to put a woman in it or whatever. And, and they said they didn't have, I don't know, whatever. They're like, the thing doesn't work for that. And I was just like, or it didn't, I think like financial viability just didn't seem like the reason to do it. And I was, and I tweeted out, I was just like, well, La Mulana 2 starring a, a, a female protagonist just made its Kickstarter, just exceeded its Kickstarter goal by fans, like hundreds of thousands of dollars. Fans wanted this game made. Game stars a woman. There you go. Boom. Proof that people actively want Shantae, you know, on Kickstarter, like another like female led game that, you know, just blew up and went. And I mean, the thing is, it's just like, you know, I mean, you may, I guess, limit yourself. I feel like people limit themselves before they even get to the point of thinking about the commercial viability of something. They're just like, eh, it's a woman. It's not going to sell. They just think that. So then they don't even bother putting effort into a lot of the other aspects of it. And I mean, I don't know. I mean, for, for all the problems that I have with the voice actress for the, for walking dead, uh, like, season two I, I doubt it's selling much less than season one did if i'm probably on par probably better because you know season one kicked up and i'm like it's got clementine as the main character i don't think people see oh it's a girl i don't want to play this game anymore like i don't think that's a thing i feel like if and i mean you know I don't know, like, you sell the game on what the game is. Like, I mean, my game's a game about punching people in the end a lot of ways. And, you know, if you can't, if you don't believe in your game, then, then you might not be able to sell it. But I'm like, like another game similar that I have uh, interesting feelings about, uh, Remember Me, like, they didn't even try. Like, I feel like people didn't like the game. Like, I know someone at Cap, formerly of Capcom, who was, like, dealing with the marketing, who didn't even really think the game was all that good, and I do. I think it's pretty good. I think they could have sold it. I think they could have totally marketed it, like, a million different ways, and I feel like people gave up on it kind of quickly, and I think it could have done a lot better. But, I mean, then again, at the same time, Bionic Commando, which was, like, you know, a reboot of a game that, uh, uh, you know, and had a lot of hype behind it coming out, out sold 27,000 copies across PS3 and 360 its first month. That's terrible. That's a game starring a dude. Like, there's lots of games starring dudes that sell nothing. So you can't tell me that putting a dude on a cover will sell copies of anything. Like, I don't think if you put a woman in Bionic Commando in the lead, that would have made it sell less. Like, I mean, like that just shows like a marketing drop on a lot of these levels. So like I have not seen any game that has actually tried to market a game starring a woman and like failed miserably. Now you mentioned Shantae did very well on Kickstarter. It took you a couple of tries on Kickstarter before you were able to get your game backed. Can you tell us about what you learned in your first experience on Kickstarter that let you nail it on the second try? Um, yeah, that's, that's a, that's a book I'm going to write uh, at some point, like the six months of, or I don't know, I've spent a long time thinking about, uh, but I think the biggest thing was that, well, one, one thing that was interesting was a friend told me, uh, sometimes you have to, you have to sell the, what's fun about the game and not the meaning behind it. It, it, it's, it's all depends on a lot of things like, like I was aiming for the brawler crowd, like brawler fighting ish game crowd. So, I mean, I could have, I don't, I don't know. Like I, I, like I tried a lot of videos that were like about the why, and I feel like trying to sell the fun is more important to people because I felt like a lot of comments I would see were like, that doesn't look very fun. And people didn't even care about the why at that point. So like, um, so I had to pretty much, I had my own messaging problem, I think. Um, I My first Kickstarter ended the week of a lot of big releases. And if you, if you, like, you can't plan to blow out of the gate. 
like that's what I thought was going to happen. I thought I was going to do really well out of the gate the first time. And so then it's like, and you can't be very ignorant of what's going on in the world around you because my first Kickstarter ended, uh, it ended the Saturday before GDC, which meant that the press, any press that would have been able to cover it that week was, couldn't have because they were getting ready for GDC. Um, or they were writing reviews for Dark Souls to um, Titanfall or Towerfall. And those are, you know, those are three games that encompass pretty much like a very wide sweep of the industry. Two were next gen, one was current gen. I know, wait, two were current gen, one was next gen. And Towerfall was the indie, like, fighting, like, you know, a uh, fun game that, like, that it's got that base covered. Tower Titanfall's got the huge FPS mar, uh, online people, and then Dark Souls Two is the the streamers delight, right? So it's like then they were all streaming. Like I wanted to do like I wanted to talk to streamers about the last week and stuff like that. And it was just like, well, no, they have stuff to stream. They have stuff that people want to see stream. It's like my little game that wasn't catching on, like whatever. Like it could have rebounded that last week, but it was like drowned out by like all, a lot of noise. And also my last day, I, I didn't even think about it, but I like planned my Kickstarter to end on a day where I was flying out to San Francisco for GDC. And uh, my flight got, I missed my flight. So I was stuck in the airport all day. And then I really just like, that was the point where I just like, let it go. It was just like, all right, uh, like I can't be on, I'm, I'm just like, I'm not going to be sitting on Twitter and, and also just like, there's a lot of things. It's just, I feel like timing is huge. Also just making sure that there's awareness out there. Cause I met, I ran into a lot of people, friends, whatever, who were like, Oh, you're running a Kickstarter. Oh, is your Kickstarter over yet? Or like just messaging was like a big thing. So, I mean, it's, it's just like, yeah, I don't know, it, it, but it's it's still like those are things I think I learned, but I've seen things. You know, if you look at a hundred Kickstarters, all of their stories are different, and a lot of them just go viral, and it's like you can't really even account for that. Yeah, it's it's very predictable, very volatile. But you did eventually succeed on Kickstarter, and now the game is on track for a 2015 release. Yeah, yeah, early 2015. And that'll be for Mac, PC, and what? anything else? At that time, uh, when it comes out, it'll probably be a PC and Mac. That's that's my goal. Uh, consoles, probably after. Unless Excellent. we can figure out how to get it out simultaneously. But, I mean, like Rami from Vlambeer said, like, somebody asked him, because they put out loof browsers across console and PC, and they someone asked him on, like, whatever, Ask FM, like, would you do that again? He's like, no. So if he, you know, if they're very, very successful people aren't going to do that again, I'm not going to do that. I don't think I'd be, I don't think I'm any better than anybody else. So before you started working on this game, you were working at Rockstar for about six years, which many gamers without knowing the specifics would probably just consider it their dream job to work at a company associated with Grand Theft Auto. Why would you leave that to work on your own stuff? Um... I mean, a myriad of things like I'm, I feel like I'm, I've been, I don't know, I've wanted to make my own games for a long time. And in my interview for the job that I ended up doing, uh, it, one of the questions was in five years, like, what would you be doing if you didn't get this job? And I was like, making video games for myself. And it's just kind of funny because that kind of just ended up being what happened. Uh, and I mean, it's just like, it's, a, you know, a lot of great people, a lot of great things, but it's just like, I don't know. I've, it's stifling to be working for someone else's creative vision when you want to do your own thing. Like, I mean, I feel like a lot of people there and a lot of game companies probably do their own thing on the side and, you know, making your own game. Like the thing is making your own thing on the side can take forever, right? Like if you're doing it, I mean, I, I was working on, you know, Treachery Beatdown City for since 2009, 2010. 
um, just kind of, but it, but, but it, but it wasn't really working on it. It was like, yeah, I came up with a sprite. Yeah. I came up with some character or yeah, I came up with this. And it's like, that's like one piece of thing done per two weeks or something, you know, like you can't really focus all of your energy on something because all of your energy is focused on a job. I mean, if I was to, if I was to go do a job right now in order to like, if someone was like, well, you need to go get a job right now. I would probably go get like a office job that had nothing to do with video games because, uh, and if like maybe something for like this, like city city or something that guaranteed like no, no hyper overtime or anything. Cause it's like, it's really hard to work on a game at 12 in the morning when you get home or one in the morning, two in the morning. Uh, especially when you've been touching controllers all day and staring at a monitor and, no matter like how great it is, it's like, well, if you want to do your own thing, it's like, it's so stifling to be working on video games all day to then come home and work on video games. Usually I would come home and like play a video game instead of work. Like, and that was kind of depressing. Cause I would like, you know, you got to decompress a little bit after work. And some days I'm just like, man, I really want to do all this stuff. And also the thing is, is like, you know, if you're working at a game company, you can't be working on your game while you're at the game company, unless that game company is really cool with it, but most aren't. And so like, you know, they all have that invention or like whatever you do at work, they own. So I pretty much, even if I had a thought, I had to suppress it and just be like, I'm not going to think about this game until after I step out of this building for the day. But Rockstar didn't have a non-compete clause that prevented you from working on the game on your own time? I mean, I wasn't really doing anything. Like, I mean, it wasn't, I didn't have any plans to sell, A, to sell it back then. But, I mean, it's not really competitive. Like, if you're, you know, like, I mean, it's like, telling somebody who works at a publishing company that they can't write their own short stories. You know, like, I mean, non-competes are kind of weird. Like, I mean, one of my favorite wrestlers, Brock Lesnar, he had a non-compete clause when he quit the WWF. And they said, like, look, you can't wrestle in America or whatever. So then he went to Japan and started wrestling. And they said, no, you can't wrestle anywhere in the world. And then he took it to court. They're like, no, this is my livelihood. And the court was like, yeah, it's his livelihood. What are you going to do? I mean, like... The thing is, is like, I mean, I was doing like, I think the thing would be more like a, like a, I don't know, like it was non-compete in that I'm not making an open world 3D game for another company. That, that'd be, that's, that's more than not what non-competes are for. They're for, and I mean, they've been shown to be wildly unable to be enforced. Like, I mean, I, I know a guy who was HR at Rockstar. He went to HR at another company. Like you can't say like, you can't do the thing you were doing at another company, uh, game company or otherwise. Um, but I mean, I've only seen a not compete really enforced, like really heavily with that whole THQ, THQ Ubisoft thing where like a dude, like I think the guy who was working on Assassin's Creed or whatever left to go work for THQ to make his Assassin's Creed ish game. And then THQ took them to court or took him to court. No, Ubisoft took him to court and pretty much froze him being able to work because they said no. He was working at, like, he was, like, in charge of, like, Assassin's Creed or whatever. And then, like, they were like, no, this would actually harm our company. Like, I mean, the thing is, is I feel like I tried to ask a lot about, like, what if I made my own iOS app while I was at work and nobody could ever give me an answer. So, but, I mean, even before I made this game, I made uh, this game called... uh, it's called the universe within made it in a game jam, uh, in early 2012. And it's like, we ended up putting it on iOS, like for free or whatever, but it's just like, it's about like collision avoidance, like flying through the universe down to like molecular level. And it's, it's interesting. It was fun. It was like a game jam game. And then I made like another game that I put up for the Molly jam that year. And I mean, you know, they're just, it, it's like short stories, like just making tiny little things. I mean, maybe people, could have gotten upset about it, but I'm like, I really couldn't point out a place in my contract where anything would have conflicted unless I was going out and making a 
3D open world game where you drew, drove around vehicles and or horses and critiqued American society heavily. So you being an indie game developer and having worked with Game Jam and Molly Jam and the like, you have made some observations about the indie game scene. And there's one that I saw in Game Informer, something you said at GDC, which I want to quote here. We live in a time when a young black child can envisage becoming the president of the United States or a CEO of a Fortune 500 company, but not a game developer. Even the indie scene has a huge problem with diversity. And I confess that's not something I had given a lot of thought to. I was you know, so excited that crowdfunding and access to tools like Unity have cracked open the opportunities for people to become game developers. So why is there still a barrier of entry there for certain groups? Um, I mean, I don't really think it's all just tools it's uh, or platforms. I mean, it's interesting. I mean, if you look at it, like the tools and the platform shift have enabled uh, like have enabled it to be easier for like the dominant force in games like white dudes to make to make more games and sell them and be successful on their own without having some richer dude on top of them lording over them now they are you know like uh and it's it's interesting to me because i didn't think about any of this stuff and it took like it took a lot of thought and just like i was like like even the dudes that i was meeting like who were making their own games who you know like i felt by meeting them inspired me to make my own games i didn't even realize that it's like you know it's a lot of older industry people that not older, but like people who had been in the industry for a while, right? Like who had like, you know, Tommy Rafina was like a badass programmer for a while. Like I didn't know that like Edmund McMillan had been making a lot of flash games for a very long time. Right. And, you know, my friends, uh, you know, Barut Pfeiffer and Jake Kasdell who made a, and skulls of Shogun with Ben Vance. Like, uh, I met those guys back when the game had no name and, uh, you know, and the, like Baruch's like this badass programmer, like he's just amazing. Like and he's been in the games industry for a while, and kind of went indie like before a lot of before that was like a thing. Like I was making his own stuff for a while, and so it just kind of shows that like you know the people with the leg up in all of these instances, like it's like oh I can go make my own games. Let me quit my job and like my job that might have paid decently, right? Like, because if you were working in the games industry, in, like a programming or art direction or something, you probably made decent amount of money. Um, and you know, go make my own thing or make your or take the last five years, which could have been from two thousand one to two thousand four, build your own engine, do your own thing, leave in two thousand seven, and go put it out somewhere. Whereas, like you know, um. Whereas we're at this point where it's just like, I think a lot of it is seeing yourself somewhere. I guess the whole envisaging yourself in a role, like that's why I was talking about Obama before, like, you know, uh, Obama being like the first black president may meant a lot to a lot of people. I think even if it was discovered tomorrow that like he had like, killed a hundred dogs and like burned all their bodies, people still wouldn't care as much because they'd be like, well, he's still like, you know, represents me in the white house or something, you know, like it'd be like a little lesser thing because you're like, well, at least it wasn't this other dude who like, I don't feel any sort of whatever, like attached to, you know, it's just like feeling like you belong is very important. And even if you stumble into stuff right now, like I still, I still find things. And it's like, you look at old ads for games and it's all like small, like dorky white kids. And it's like, that wasn't, that was my existence. I was a dorky kid in school, but I was not a dorky white kid. So it's like, you don't even see yourself in any ads. Like I've, I've been kind of thinking about like, when did, when did like, when was like the big push for like, you know, like Sega, like, I don't know, Sega, you know, maybe, Streets of Rage start a black character as one a black character and a woman as two of the main characters and still the 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 commercial for it is like a dorky white kid like in class being bullied and then uh, when he buys Streets of Rage or when his parents buy him Streets of Rage and he comes back now all of a sudden he's a badass with like 
girls hanging off his arm and all the bullies like now feeding him. And it just feels like that commercial in itself was white male fantasy, power fantasy. It was weird. Like, so that is what this industry has pretty much held up as, uh, you know, status quo. Like they've said, like, so you think like, you know, the kids that were watching these ads back then that are now, you know, in their twenties, thirties, whatever, still have this kind of like, it's not for me type of thing. And then when you see, you know, websites are run by people that don't look like them and game companies are like, there's old ads for Nintendo where, or like uh, news reports where they're like, we're in the whatever for Nintendo, we're in the uh, warehouse for making their games. And it's like all Japanese people on the conveyor belts, like putting together the boxes and the things then you see and they deliver them. And then it's like a group of white kids that are the focus test playing them. And you're just like, like none of this portion feels like it's me. And I mean, I know for me, like I always felt like games were super far. I had no clue that like game lab was a thing in New York and uh, that it was like a company being run by people in New York. So I always felt like games were far. Like it was like Redmond, Washington or Austin, uh, which still didn't feel like me. Like I'm from New York. So just even that instance that I was all, I was interested in making games, but the geographical locations kind of held it back. Like I was like, Oh, I got to go move to like all the way across the country in order to go make games. Like, and then, you know, there wasn't a lot of, I don't know. There wasn't a lot of education for games, even though like, I don't know, school's kind of like neither here nor there, I think for a lot of that stuff. Um, but I feel like things are getting better now but they're going to take a long time of it takes a lot of, I still have friends who like, I mean, I used to hang around uh, the breakfast, uh, the little cafeteria table and, you know, we would all talk about games and I'm the only one making games out of everybody. And like, some of them are just like, wow, I can't believe you're doing this. Like, and I'm just like, yo, you could do it too. And they're all like, ah, oh, you know, I don't have time in my life or whatever. And it's like, like it's taken, like it takes an enormous amount of, I think, perseverance to say, like, I'm going to go sacrifice a lot of my free time, do this, do that, to try to put something out that doesn't necessarily have a guarantee of, you know, making back a lot of money. And also, I mean, like I, like I think about it, how it's like, like the whole Fortune 500 company. It's like, you know, John Johnson runs a like Jet Magazine. Like he did built that a long time ago. Like you could read about him in Forbes. It's like that's interesting. Like fortune 500, whatever. That's interesting. Like you can read about that. You can say, Oh, I could run a magazine and you know, there's jet magazine. Jet, it's a magazine that you can see that you can pick up and hold. That is a, like a black owned created magazine for like black people. That's cool. I mean, I feel like the things that are for and made by and, can be limiting in of themselves, but they can also be, you know, kind of empowering. Like you can say like, Oh, I want to make a movie director. Who's made movies. Oh, Spike Lee's made movies. Like regardless of what you feel about him, it's like a black man's made movies like that have made money. Like, uh, like I feel like we share a lot of problems, with, like the comic book industry where it's like, you know, you don't see a lot of white, you don't see a lot of black characters. You don't see a lot of black creators. Um, and that can just be stifling. Like, you're just like, Oh, I don't know. I don't know if, I don't know if that's, that's for me. I feel like that's the key thing is like just not being able to see yourself doing something is in a quick enough way. Like that's like, and that's the thing, like you see, there's a lot of pressures in, in society and like to be creative or to not go get, you know, a real job means you've got to go excel in sports or, try to excel in music like those are the two places that you know like young black and latino children can see immediate success i mean it's gonna take forever but you know you don't know that when you're like five right you just see like all these people that like have a lot of money that are doing a lot of things that you know LeBron James is like the most hated and loved person in the country for a week and you can see that it's very tangible and like your, your family can see that. And they're like, yeah, why don't you go be like that person? I mean, and there's lots of failed, like nobody does a news story on the lots of failed sports people. So 
Um, and in games, it's like there's nobody like that. There's nobody that you can just point to and say, like, oh, yeah, that person was successful, and that means I can be successful too. It's kind of a kind of a dumb thing to think about, but I feel like just seeing yourself there is, like, is very key. No, it definitely breaks down a mental barrier. As soon as you see or hear somebody else doing it, it makes it possible in your mind, and you start – being able to you know pursue that same dream as well because you know you're not just wasting your time somebody else has set the precedent now what about in games themselves are you know being able to see yourself in a game being able to identify with a protagonist with a main character can certainly be very important to be able to you know see yourself in that game and inject yourself into that reality what sort of issues are there with certain demographics being represented in games? For example, we have, you know, The Walking Dead. You mentioned Streets of Rage, Gears of War. But one of my PAX panelists this past spring, Dwayne DeFore, said that he's tired of always seeing the black guy as the tank character. So are, are there certain stereotypes that we really could do without in video games? I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, it's sort of, yeah, I mean... Oh, it's weird. Like, I mean, there's, I don't know. I mean, we're, we're at a point in this industry where like, you know, in the elder scrolls games, the darker skinned, bigger people have like a negative intelligence and a plus in strength, like the red guard. And I mean, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's fantasy mythology right there. Right. Like it's, it's uh, somebody on this guy, um, on Twitter was actually just talking about this morning about how it's like, you know, we live in a country where all, all this stuff's going on. They're cheer there. They just murdered a 18 year old black kid for maybe stealing candy or, and they murdered a 22 year old black guy for holding a BB gun in a Walmart. Um, and who's a father. And, uh, you know, regardless, nobody knew that, but, they killed that guy, Eric Garner, for allegedly selling illegal cigarettes, like cigarettes illegally or whatever. And it's like we're we're in a country where, like, these stereotypes already exist. Like, they're already, like, I mean, you just think about all this. So it's, like, becomes kind of, yes, definitely a bit, like, more important to not always cast, like, the black dude as the prisoner or the guy who got upset and killed somebody or the guy who, or who's inherently like sort of bad or sort of less intelligent. But like, I think it comes down to another like people. I don't know. I, I really don't know. But um, I mean, we're in this. And then it's just like we look at. There's, I don't know, there's too many problems to list. I mean, there's. It's, it's really kind of like staggering. Like I, I, for me personally, like I feel like a big solution would be if you had more black creators or Latin creators or Arab creators or anybody, you would see, you wouldn't see change immediately. You, you'd see, you wouldn't see change immediately and you're not seeing super amounts of change immediately. And even in the indie space, because, you know, games culture rules culture in the game world. Like, I, I saw a Kickstarter for this game, Breach TD, and I was like, oh, that game looks interesting. Oh, it's a, like a friend linked it to me, and it was like, oh, it's made by a team out of Puerto Rico. I'm like, that's cool. I'm looking at this game, and then I'm starting to, I start to, like, my, my gut started to sink because I was just like, it's a free-to-play, like, real-time, like, art, like, uh, like, kind of a play on RTS, like, in Tower Defense. And I'm like, that's okay. And then it's like starring like sci-fi warriors and Vikings and fantasy. And I'm just like, yeah, games culture. That's what's cool in games. Like, and when we look at like, like games, like, I don't know, league or any of these hundred plus character amalgamations of bullshit. Like you just see like games culture coming through, like where everything has to be like, <clears throat> everything has to be like rote sci-fi or fantasy or, viking fantasy nowadays like vikings have become big or zombies or all of them that's what that game was like all of them put together and it's just like and i mean you play mass effect and it's like oh now we're going on the zombie thing now we're going on the like 
weird other thing. And I mean, it's actually funny. I, I mentioned, I'm still trying to write this article about like experience. My experiences just in this industry for unwinnable. And, uh, one of the interesting things, it's like, you know, the guy, uh, and I'm blanking on his name. I've like kind of blanked on a lot of mass effect just because I got angry at part three, uh, for whatever reason. And, but the black guy in part two, his whole side story is that like, he doesn't, doesn't know, hasn't seen his dad in a long time. And, and you go in his side story is you go see his dad on a colony and his dad's kind of like a raving lunatic, uh, like cult leader essentially. And you're like, y'all realize that there's a problem with like black fathers not being there for their kids, like in history. And it's just like, why are you making this in the future in sci-fi Bill? Like you're, you're just bringing back, like, like you're just, somehow you're reinforcing this stereotype that exists now. Um, and yet, yet you're in the future. Whereas like, you know, a guy like Garrus can have an interesting, like you can have a more detailed bird man creature than a black character. Like black character can't have any nuance cause he's a person. He's got to be like a black guy, but like Garrus can be anything like Talia can be anything, but like, I mean, and, and still like, I mean, you've got Colonel Anderson, which is cool. It's a cool dude. But like, still like the fact that the guy on your ship is the one that you have to interact with and going off on this planet, you have to do this weird daddy issue mission. You're just like, and I, so I feel like if you, so games culture is this huge dominant thing where people like let everything kind of fall to the wayside for it. And I feel like in order to get people to be comfortable, like destroying games culture and put injecting their own cultures into it, you have to give them time. And cause it's funny, like, I mean, this industry tries to do it occasionally. I, I was talking about how, um, NBA street volume two is hip hop in game form. Like it, it uses, like, I mean, it starts off with like saxophone, like to a, like, cause it's a reminisce over you by a Pete rock and CL smooth. And it starts up with just this sax beat over like this beautiful, like, court like flat shaded thing and the soundtrack was lovingly picked out and it was just this very it was this very strong piece of culture that ea decided to just throw away when they switched teams for the second game or no the next game nba street home court or no nba street three and then home court and it was like come on dudes like they were done by home court it was like they were never going to make another game because they were just like squandering it and it was like they made a piece of culture and then they kind of immediately backed away from it. Same thing with like Def Jam, like the series, they were like working on something that was very surface level at first, got a little deeper, got, had like fan favorite rappers in it, like, like a bone crusher, like, and then the next one, like they made a real, and then because of the need to sequelize things, they just made another one. Uh, they lost the initial team. So that's another thing to think about is just like, you know, making games is like, like, I don't know. Cause MB, uh, NBA street was made by a specific team. Like uh Def jam was made by a really good Japanese team, which is interesting. And then they, you know, they fused American and like Japanese influences to make this game. And then when they lost the Japanese team, they brought it all over here and the whole thing tanked. And then they haven't like revisited it since. And it's just like, like games have this thing where it's like people feel like they have to invest a ton of money. They have to make a ton of money. Things have to be viable. Uh, they, for whatever reason, they see like white dude space Marine as viable, even as many times as it fails. Uh, they see black stereotypes. They don't even think about them. I don't think uh, like the bald black cop is like this thing. That's just like everywhere, which isn't actually a bad stereotype, but it's just everywhere. And like, you know, I feel like, you just don't have much space over there. And like, but if you have more people making games, eventually you'll start to see that like, you know, filtering into bigger games. Like I feel like independent games are heavily influencing bigger games. Like you're starting to see way more color 
coming back to bigger games. Like, you know, I feel like Sunset Overdrive wouldn't exist without the, like, garish stylings of some of the smaller, like, independent games. Because, like, why would Microsoft fund, like, the brightest... I mean, I guess they did in the past, like, with Cameo and stuff like that. But, like, you know, our industry was going through brown phase, right? With Gears of War and all that stuff. And now we're back to colorful phase. Because I think independent games have said, no, we need colors. So I feel like if independent games said, no, we need more people of color that aren't just badly done stereotypes, then maybe other people would say, oh, all right. Yeah, I think it's likely, or at least maybe I'm being optimistic or naive, that a lot of these stereotypes are being reinforced by people who are, aren't even consciously aware that they're doing it. I know going back again to the example where Mr. Dwayne DeFord made the observation about the black tank character, one of the other panelists in that same discussion is a developer who was working on a game that was reinforcing that stereotype and was not even aware that she was doing so until Dwayne made that observation. And when she heard that, she's like, oh crap, I'm one of those developers. I need to go back to my studio after this panel and change that. And as a result, their next game that they're working on won't feature that stereotype. I don't know exactly how they have fixed it or changed it, but you know, having that discussion and having people involved in that discussion that represent a variety of you know lifestyles and backgrounds and experiences is really important and feeling i think safe to safe to change things because i feel like a lot of this comes from above you know a lot of this just comes from a like yeah whatever like that's not important like we need to make sure that this is like relatable or whatever Now, I know you've given several talks on this topic. I think I missed you at PAX East earlier this year, and you were most recently at GamerX. How was that event? GamerX was really good. Um, It was uh, interesting because I, it's it's interesting, like I, I, uh, Tony, one of the organizers, she felt she wanted, she invited me after IndieCade last year to come give the same talk I did at IndieCade there. And over the year, I just kind of, you know, I, I try to be very, I don't know, I was very aware of actually like during the Obama, during Obama running or like a lot of the gay rights issues, there was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of talk of like racism in the gay community. And so I've like looked at a lot of that stuff and I've become friends with a lot of people that are identify as uh, LGBTQ in the community one of those letters on a lot of like a lot of great people and even still like you know gamer x like it didn't feel like a place that my voice belonged like i didn't really and i kind of told tony i was just like i don't know if i want to if i should do this like i don't know if i would be welcome really and she kept saying like no like please come please do this talk um and and then it's funny when i got there the keynote was matt Kahn that you interviewed right and he said you know, when you see a thing called Gamer X, when you think gay, like you think sh- like cis gay white guy and that he's just like, well, and Gamer X clearly is not that. And it was interesting because Gamer X had like a lot of black people there. And I was like, that's really cool. Like it's, it's interesting when you look at more niche, uh, like smaller groups that are like, yeah, we're all about inclusivity where, you expressly can't be like you can't they like where like hate speech is specifically told that no you can't use hate speech other people say oh i feel safe in this space so you start seeing like you know minorities like like ethnic minorities along with gender minorities and uh sexual orientation minorities they all come together into like a space and i felt you know I felt like a minority in that space for a different reason, mostly because like, I was just like, you know, straight cis dude, which is fine. It was actually really refreshing that like, I felt like race wasn't that big of an issue on my mind, but it was still kind of an issue because like, it was funny because like, uh, there was actually a talk about like, you know, diversifying your games and none of the people on it were like of an ethnic minority. And Uh, I was, I mean, it was two women and uh, a dude and that's fine. But like, I, I kind of had a feeling that none of that was really going to come up and none of it really did come up. 
Um, and so I brought it up, <laughs> which is funny. Uh, cause Christine love who was on the panel, like, uh, she does her own like stuff. And I, what my question was less for her and more for the San saints row, uh, the person who works at Volition, because like, I actually had a real big problem with the fact that all the ads for saints row, uh, you know, it's a game about creating your own avatar and yet your own avatar in all their ads or as a white dude. And it's like, and like Keith, Keith David's like Keith Richards, Keith David. Yeah. He's in the background, right? Like he's just a background character. And it's like, yeah, but he's a star. Like he's like legendary and you're just kind of throwing him in the background in favor of white protagonist guy in a game where you can be anybody. And it's, it's less about like me having, I'm just like, why? Like, it feels lazy if you're going to make like Saints Row is about throwing caution to the wind and yet their advertising's all just this white character. And you're like, why is that? I mean, same thing like Sunset Overdrive, all it's all the most boring, like punk, like white character, dude. And you're like, yeah, but that looks like a lot of other characters. Like, I have no problem with the fact that it's a white character. I just have a problem that it just doesn't seem imaginative. Like, it's not even like a great character design. Like in a game where you can put anything on your character, you made this very boring character. I would think Saints Row ads would be more interesting if they featured all the different types of people that you could be in the game. That would be more interesting because it would actually be kind of weird and it would be off-putting because you'd be seeing like, like you could even cut, show the same cutscene switching between people. And that would be interesting because you'd be like, oh, I can be anybody. That would just change your perception of it. So, and then, and then my talk was the last talk, which I think some people took issue with because they were like, why was this talk pushed in the corner? But it was because I was bad at planning and I didn't, uh, and I, I still felt like very busy this year. And I just felt very, and my whole thing with Tony, I was just going back and forth. I was like, I don't know. I don't know. Blah, blah. And then when my Kickstarter is over, I finally was able to say like, okay, fine, I'm going to come. And here's my talk and blah, blah. And then she gave me two options. One was on Friday, which would have been up against the big gear gearbox panel, which I didn't really want to go up against a big group of like industry famous people and against a Dogecoin talk at the end of the conference. And I was like, I'll do that one because I think I could get a good crowd. And my talk was packed. My talk was full and it was pretty much the only talk that was dealing with like race and in the and like diversity in the games creation side hoping to because my whole talk is about like essentially it boils down to it's like you know if you look at if you look at like other industries it's like well diversity only helps and diversity in games helps because the west if the west hadn't picked up where the east kind of dropped it like our industry would have fallen apart again. Right. Like, I mean, our industry has fed off of, it's like, you know, the, 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 like the West destroyed games with Atari and then Nintendo brought it back and then Nintendo and various other and square and all these other companies kind of started dropping the ball and the, and the middleware era of the PS2 era showed like GTA come into prominence and all these other things. So then those grab back. Like, so like now, and now the East is now like Japan and like a lot of other countries are saying like, you know, we need to step up and we need to, you know, start making games that are a little more global or whatever. So you're just seeing games and if you, but, but that's still the battle between like the white West and like Japan and like Korea or whatever. And so I feel like if you look at, but if you look at the, like, and I show a video of Jet Set Radio, and it's like Jet Set Radio is a hip hop game. And it's like, well, where did they get this from? Well, they got this from kids that were hanging out in the Bronx that had nothing better to do, right? 30 years prior. So it's like, well, if that can funnel up and, but, but, but hip hop is bigger, like hip hop is bigger than video games. Like hip hop is like global culture. It's dominant. Like it's, but it, and it came from, it came from like people who are, you know, like, like uh, Bill Cosby would love uh, jazz to be called black American music. And it's like, because it was, you know, it's, it's very, it's black. It's American. Like it's like a lot of our culture is from the black populace that was like dragged over here. Right. Like from immigrants that came here, like this whole country is built up of all these different cultures and then hip hop as a form, like, you know, it got its roots 
like Def Jam didn't start with just LL Cool J. It was like the Beastie Boys too. You could immediately like, like, so, you know, and it was founded by like a white dude. So it was like, you could immediately see yourself in there. And I mean, who are the biggest buyers of hip hop? Like white kids. And uh, I actually just saw a talk with uh, Paul Rosenberg, who's uh, Eminem's manager and like friend and co-business person. And uh, he was, and somebody in the audience asked, like, do you think him being white is like a benefit? And they were like, and he's like, well, who buys most of the music? Like, I mean, who's most of this country? And he's like, yeah, I think it's beneficial. And I don't think it was like a flippant way. He was just saying like, you know, white kids see themselves in Eminem. So then they buy the music because they are like, oh, I feel like I can be him. And even Eminem talks about that a lot. He talks about how like the whole thing, the whole paradigm shift between him and Dr. Dre, like it's like him being produced by a black producer meant that like black people could be on board with him because he actually had a hard time breaking out. Like I first heard Eminem on a rock station in New York because Hot 97 refused to play him. And so you just look at like, you know, all these different things where it's like, you know, you see yourselves in media, these people invent this thing, other people come in and they, you know, co-opt or, you know, become a part of it. And then the medium just grows. And it's like, right now we're in, we're in territory where it's like, games are still very niche. I mean, we're, we're like still bordering comics for how niche we are, except comics are making hundreds of millions of dollars in their opening weekend. Whereas a video game movie is still kind of the laughing stock of like the movie industry where Uwe Boll is the guy who makes most of those video game movies. And so like, we're still very niche culture. And it's like, you know, even though like, you know, a game on steam can sell a million copies, it's like, but who is that to like, that's to the indoctrinated, right? Like that's not to, greater culture. And I feel like a little bit of that speaks to, I like, I'm, I'm curious, like we, there's like, they say that like, um, black and Latino game buying populace is huge. Like it's like borderline, like 50% of the industry. And so, but I don't think that's, that translates into steam sales necessary because they're not consoles. Right. So like, I feel like that was all cause no one ever really took PC gaming into and PC gaming's becoming like a lot bigger. And I like, I'm a PC gamer now these days more so than a console. And, but I don't think you have that market on PC. Like, I mean, because consoles mean something like, I mean, that's what, uh, like Phil from a uh, young horses said earlier this year, he was just like, he got a lot of flack for it. And he, where he said like, when he says he's coming out on PlayStation, like his parents know what that means. But when he says he's coming out on PC or Steam or whatever, nobody knows what any of that means. So that just shows that even that's niche in and of itself. So it's like if you have more people of more, you know, cultures going out making these games for this culture, then it can just loop back and grow things because you risk selling the same games to the same million people. And then it becomes smaller. Like, cause you're like, I'm not going to buy this next game. Cause I already have this last game and you want to grow the buying populace. Um, so, I mean, that was like a lot of the talk and, uh, the thing, the, the thing that was interesting was just that, uh, I mean, I feel like I try, try to like base it in a way where like people can just see it as, yeah, like, I didn't really think of things like that. Like you were saying, like the guy on the panel before was like saying things people don't, I just, I'm more about just spreading information, not necessarily all about like, a, like I'm not saying like white people are bad. Cause I'm like, clearly not like, I'm like my mom's white. So it's like, I mean, I have lots of great friends who are white and it's like, I, and it's, it's interesting. It's weird to tell somebody that it's like, yo, you need to, you need to try to get more other people in your industry or else like your industry is going to fail and other people are like struggling, right? There's lots of white game programmers and designers and whoever that are selling hundreds of copies of games on steam instead of hundreds of thousands. Right. So it's kind of hard to like, uh, be able to do that. But I mean, uh, people at gamer X really dug the talk. I wish I would have been able to give it earlier. So I'd have been able to talk to people more for the, 
the weekend about it. Like, cause I, I feel like a lot of people came up and were like, wanted to talk to me about it afterwards. And I've made a few friends out of that talk. Uh, but I wish I could have been able to talk to the newer people before. Cause I talked to a lot of friends for most of the weekend or a lot of friends of friends that I met that time. But I think the interesting thing was I've never felt more uh, safe in a space than there. And it's interesting because like, yeah, I'm like, I'm, I'm not the target demographic, but like walking in and I, I don't know. I felt very emotional the whole weekend because it felt very, felt very open to me. And that was very important. Well, it's certainly a conference I'd like to attend someday. I know you've attended a lot of different events and, you know, given, given you context to make observations like that, and you've given talks at a lot of them. Uh, some of those are on Vimeo. They were recorded and I'll definitely link to that in the show description. Uh, rather than have you repeat all of that here, you've covered a ton of great ground in the last hour. Thanks so much for giving me this time. Yeah. I know that it's, you know, early on a Sunday morning, you have a family to get back to. Is there anything else you want to chat about before we wrap up? I, I could talk about a million things, so I'm going to just leave it. <laughs> all right. Can you remind our listeners where to find you online? Uh, yeah. I mean, you can go, I have newchallenger.com and you challenger. Uh, a new challenger is my Twitter. Uh, beatdowncity.com is my game. Beatdown underscore city is my Twitter handle for that. Uh, I tweet about pretty much or retweet anything from my game thing. So I mean, if I'm, if you want to, if you want to hear the ramblings of everything, you can follow me. If you just want to hear about the game, you can follow the game. And do you have any other conferences? Any other appearances coming up? Oh yeah, um, going to going to PAX Prime. I'll be there. I'll have my game with me there. Can't really talk about the particulars, but you'll be able to find me there. And uh, going to be at Indie Kid doing, I think, two two panels. And my wife, Diana, will also be at Indie Kid doing a panel, too. So that'll be cool. Excellent. Well, I, I don't think I'm going to be at any of those sessions, but if you happen to come to PAX East again, I'll be sure to look you up. Yeah, I'll be there. Now. I mean, I'm in New York. That's I have to be at PAX East next year. Next year is going to be rough, like, GDC, uh, GDC, PAX East first day is Friday of GDC. So that means I'd probably have to leave if I go, if I go to GDC next year, I'd have to leave on Thursday. And that's some, that's night. some unfortunate timing of those two shows. Yeah, um, like they need to, they need to get that shit together because it's like, this is another thing that's interesting is it's like, you know, I give a talk about just trying to break down barriers in games. It's interesting because you talk about like just one last thing. Um, Cause like a uh, Brandon Sheffield who uh, used to work for Gama Sutra. Uh, he, he like helped try to he put together like a lot of really great talks for the game career seminar or summit or whatever for uh, GDC this year, which is like for students and everything and just people who are thinking about being in games. And he tried to put together a lot of highly diverse panels where you have a panel about crowdfunding as an unknown uh, with like a black guy, a woman, and another two guys, but like of all varying like genders and uh, sexual orientations and, you know, identity and everything. And I was like, that's really cool. That's great. And you've got like, uh, you know, Zoe Quinn was speaking and uh, Jim Crawford speaking about like interesting things that weren't really tackled anywhere else in the conference. And by having, it's interesting. I don't know. And I don't know if this is going to happen, but by having, you know, packs bleed into GDC like that, you might lose a lot of people for that Friday. Like people might not be able to even be there. And then, you know, students who want to be around, who want to interface with these developers, these developers might have had to leave already and go to PAX. And it's like, I feel like I wouldn't be where I'm at today if I hadn't forced myself to interface with like a ton of people. Like I went to talks my first GDC like three years ago. And then afterwards I talked, I found the people who were doing talks and I went to like the expo floor and I talked to them more about their stuff and you know, so that like, you know, their talk inspired me. I went and talked to them some more and then they was able to keep me going. And a lot of those people are my friends today. So it's like, you know, I don't know, like 
yeah, it's going to be kind of weird because it also puts you in a weird position. Like, oh, do I want to stay and give a talk at the game career seminar? But what if I need to go like hock my wares at PAX East? Like, it's like especially as an indie independent game developer or whatever, you, that's a real threat, right? Like, which is more financially viable? Like, and because you're still going to talk to a lot of people one way or the other. But what is better? What is better for you? What what can you afford to do? Because GDC is not cheap to even be at. So do you even go if you have to leave like two days early or something? Yeah, there's so much occurring at any one of these events that you're going to miss something, which is why I missed your previous PAX East panel. To have two conventions going on simultaneously is unfortunate, is putting it lightly. I mean, they, they happen like Dragon Con's happening the weekend of PAX, but I feel like it's just GDC and PAX like are there is a overlap of a Venn diagram there of people who are interested in making games. And it's just like, if you're at GDC, you have a specific, like you're looking for a job actively or whatever. I don't know. It's, but it's, it's pulling the developers more in two different places than even the fan base. So it's like not fair for one or the other. Like, cause that there was like someone who said like, there was like tips for GDC. And one of them was don't buy a student pass. And that was cause the student pass was, it's getting better because now it includes like sponsored talks, I think. But before it was just for Friday and a lot of people leave. And the whole point was they said a lot of developers leave before Friday. So you were not going to see people. And that was the thing. Like, it's just like, so then when you have a thing that actually says like, no, you need to leave to go to this thing, then, then that becomes like a weird dilemma for people. Yeah, very much so. Well, regardless of where you end up spending your time, I definitely appreciate you giving us oh, yeah, an hour of your time. Thanks for covering all this stuff. It's been great. Yeah, thank you. All right, have a good day. You too.